Let me uh, welcome everybody to this colloquium. It's a bit of a special co colloquium um, related to, uh, to, to Peter's uh, nomination for the New Scientist uh, Science Talent uh, Program or award. So uh, let me first introduce Peter for those of you that don't know him. He's been around at uh, the TUI and Differ for a long time. Uh, I've known Peter ever since he did his uh, master's project at, uh, at Princeton working on a liquid metal diverter design for NSTX-U, which I think is a design that they're still quite happy with and planning at some point in the future to perhaps install. Um, um, but after that, uh, Peter did such a good job that um, we persuaded him to do a PhD in Eindhoven, which, which built on this. And uh, you will probably see something about this in the, in the presentation. He started that in 2015. And uh, afterwards, in 2019, he secured a Eurofusion engineering grant, which again built on all the successful and great work that he uh, did during his PhD. Um, so Peter is somebody I would say with a huge amount of uh, ingenuity and energy and enthusiasm. And uh, he was also, I should mention, started his and co-founded his own startup called ESOX. Um, and this is uh, something I don't fully understand how it works because uh, but uh, it's 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 more or less is for collective bargaining for sustainable and, and green energy solutions for your energy needs um, it sounds very cool and the sort of thing that we need to move into a, a, a green society um, and so um, without further ado I, I hand the floor to Peter to for this uh, for, should be very interesting colloquium the floor is yours Peter yeah, so thank you all for joining. Indeed, the point was also to uh, promote this uh, competition a bit, but also actually the point would be that I hope to uh, provide you in return with a very interesting talk that I will uh, that I hope you really will enjoy. So let's just uh, dive right in. And I want to take a look at this movie to show you that there is a huge challenge in fusion, which is uh, developing the heat shields, because these are living in a rather... Uh, violent environment, I would say, as you can see here. And of course, this is only uh, an experiment done in Magnum PSI, but the reality will be will be many times more uh, severe conditions, actually, or at least a few times. And as you can see here in Magnum, already the, the cameras have a hard time uh, keeping up. Uh, imagine what the sample has to uh, go through that is directly exposed to this heat load. So. Let's take a look first at uh, why these heat shields are so important. And then afterwards, we'll dive into uh, the real work. So the story starts with a fusion, of course. Uh, this is a nuclear fusion research. And we are doing this because um, it is a sustainable energy source. And as you all know, um, there are some advantages. There is uh, you know, the same type of nuclear reactions as in the sun, which means that there are very little to non-nuclear uh, waste products from this reaction. It is inherently safe. There are no you know, risks at runaways or meltdowns, this kind of thing. There is abundant fuel for a thousand years or so. And finally, what I find also very important is that it's quite compact and we do not have unlimited land. So this is actually uh, an important point. Now, currently is a very exciting time for fusion. Actually, ITER, uh, the first reactor to produce net energy, is being built as we speak and should uh, produce uh, interesting results uh, in the coming years. But that being said, it will take still many more years to really deploy a large amount of fusion reactors. So if you look at the energy transition on the relatively short term, which I've just put here as about uh, 50 years uh, from now, you know, we are trying to prevent catastrophic climate change and fusion will have a very, very limited role in that. Uh, but on the long term, we do have to work towards a sustainable energy system that, that can last for a really long term. And in that energy system, I do believe that fusion will have a uh, important role to play. So that is why fusion is important. Um, what about these heat shields? Now, this is also, of course, um, very familiar if you are already a fusion expert. But in the reactor, we have a plasma in which the fusion reactions take place. But the plasma and the power that is being generated flow outside along a magnetic field. And you can see the, the path indicated by the lines towards the wall of the reactor. 
and in particular toward a set of uh, shields uh, at the bottom, which is called the diverter. And in the diverter, the impact of this plasma and this power is the biggest, so easily the diverter can melt. And moreover, if you lose control of the plasma and it uh, becomes destabilized, uh, in a, about a millisecond or so, you can destroy your entire diverter, which means there is a billion dollar investment uh, down the drain. And so that means if we cannot build a diverter that cannot uh, survive a disruption, then nobody's going to build a fusion reactor. Yeah, And it will, in fact, be very impractical to operate it because there is a chance that such a disruption occurs. Now, interestingly, the opposite is also true. If you could make a better diverter, what you actually do is you remove one of the constraints on the reactor design and you could explore new ways to, make, uh, to scale it. So, for example, you can make it more compact and therefore cheaper and therefore an easier investment. So, uh, a better diverter might definitely make for a better react make for a better reactor, which is very nice. And so this is where my uh, my job actually lies. So my job is to do R and D research and development to create this better diverter, and we're going to do that with liquid metals. So the question is: Are liquid metal diverters the solution for fusion, um, for the future of fusion? And I want to talk to you about the three steps that I, that I took. Um, and the first one is. Let's design actually a very small experimental type of diverter that allows us to do experiments and to gain insight into the behavior and, and to the performance that a liquid metal diverter might provide. So let's take a look at the principle to start with, so you understand. There are two uh, general principles which we, which we very much like about liquid metal diverters, which is that the first they are self-healing. And second, we think they can withstand incredibly high heat loads because of something called vapor shielding. Um, and to understand exactly why that is the case, let's take a look first at a conventional solid heat shield. Um, so what you see here is a, is a version of a, a tungsten diverter. Uh, and actually in the picture you see uh, right, a tungsten armor layer in, in a sort of grayish color on top of a copper channel through which water will flow. And uh, this is a bit of a special mock-up, but because usually the tungsten goes all the way around. And these are, you know, state-of-the-art solutions. There actually goes a lot of engineering into manufacturing the tungsten, into joining the tungsten to the pipes, all these things. It, it is really state-of-the-art. But nevertheless, there is a sort of inherent limitation. And uh, because the problem is that the plasma will erode the tungsten. And so to have a, a long lifetime, uh, you want to start out with a nice thick block, and this will get thinner over time. But okay, if you start out with a thick block, you will have some uh, some lifetime. But at the same time, you want to keep the block from melting. And um, well, to keep the surface cool, you want to make the block thin. That is how thermal conduction works. Uh, a thicker block will get hotter on the top. So you want to start out with a nice thin block from this perspective, not a thick block. And and this is an inherent uh, conflict of interest that that you can only go so far. In compromising. And for a liquid metal diverter, you can then immediately see why this might be a good idea. So the plasma heat flux again erodes some liquid metal, um, but that's fine because you can have a liquid metal flow and there can be replenishment. And so we have point one, self-healing. And the evaporated metal uh, goes actually into, a, in, into what we call a vapor cloud, but this vapor cloud also acts as a sort of shield, hence the term uh, vapor shielding. So, so, you know, power uh, is, is dissipated by this cloud because the cloud heats up, uh, the particles are lost to elsewhere, or maybe they radiate. And this, we think, or thought, uh, and now we know for sure, can be a very effective way to dissipate heat. But then there remain some practical challenges. So, how would you go about keeping uh, such a liquid in place? Because, you know, there is gravity, there are magnetic fields and currents uh, pulling uh, at this liquid and, and, and wanting it to move all over the place. So keeping it in place is usually done with uh, capillary forces. Uh, so like a sponge, the, the liquid is sucked up and it stays in place quite nicely. And one typical way to make these uh, porous structures is to use meshes. So um, basically layers of woven 
uh, metal wire. But this is not straightforward. So here you see a sample that we exposed in Magnum at the beginning of my PhD. And after a single plasma exposure, we melted through all these mesh layers and it's a complete uh, wreck, so to say. And then what I did is I actually made a, another target. And this one has a single mesh layer on the top. But in the middle of that, you can already see there is a hole. Uh, and behind that was a reservoir and, 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 and uh, some other things. But the mesh layer is damaged and that is not ideal. And even if you have expert builders, so for example, here's a, a great picture that was sent to us from a Compass. They uh, installed a liquid metal limiter, uh, which is uh, also a plasma facing component. This was built by a Russian team that are also absolute experts on, on making these uh, components. But even there, you can see there it, it has spectacularly failed, unfortunately. So there are big holes and the liquid metal has gone uh, all over the place, although it was still a very uh, useful experiment, I should say. So how do we how do we fix this? We came up with the following. Let's uh, do some 3D printing. So uh, Philips has developed uh, for uh, uh, X-ray optics the capability to print uh, tungsten, and you can do something fantastic with this. Uh, namely, we designed a component that works a bit like an oil lamp. So there is a reservoir, there is capillary flow to the plasma facing surface, and then that plasma facing surface is supplied completely automatically, passively with liquid metal. Um, and this works very practical. So, so you know, you uh, take a bunch of these, you fill them in um, uh, outside of your experiment, you prepare them, then you put them inside your experiment, you use them until the liquid metal is depleted, and um, well, afterwards you fill them again which looks beautiful, by the way. So here is a, a target filled with lithium in the in the glove box uh, at Differ. So this works great. And what's even better is that because we can use 3D printing, because of course, you know, there are other ways to make solid uh, porous materials. Um, but with 3D printing, you can really control very well the internal geometry of such a sample. So you can maximize capillary flow and you can reduce thermal stresses due to you know uh, heating thermal expansion bending you can reduce those stresses to virtually negligible levels so um 3d printed tungsten is not as strong as regularly manufactured tungsten it's only about uh, has about half the strength let's say but it's absolutely irrelevant because the stresses are also irrelevant and from that perspective, for those of you, uh, of you who are familiar with the uh, neutron loading, neutrons continuously degrade the materials in uh, fusion reactors. That's a big problem. But we might uh, wonder, actually, is that still a problem here? If the material has virtually uh, no need for strength, does it matter if we lose a little? So that is actually a very interesting uh, side note here. All right, so we made a bunch of these samples. Uh, now it's time for step two. Let's do some research. Uh, and the question here is, this vapor shielding mechanism, can we understand how that works? And what are the limitations, actually? Is it enough to survive, for a component to survive in a real reactor? Um, we use Magnum PSI. Uh, you have seen it already in the movie in the beginning. It is a linear plasma beam that creates conditions very similar to a tokamak, actually. We can add millisecond pulses on top of a steady state load. So you can have a steady state. Uh, you know, you can turn the plasma beam on for hours, but you can add millisecond pulses to mimic plasma instabilities uh, on top of this. Uh, for those in the, in the fusion field, uh, of course, I refer to the ELMS. And then uh, we can measure a lot of things, as you know, but today I'm going to take a look at surface temperature view from the lithium cloud that we can see from the side with a high-speed camera. And uh, of course, we can example the samples afterwards. OK. Now, the temperature uh, is maybe the most trivial thing, but it's also, I find, the most interesting and most uh, insightful thing. So what we see here is a striking difference if we view the temperature over time between samples that have been uh, put in as a reference, so a 3D printed sample without any liquid metal inside, and on the other hand, samples filled with lithium. And, and, and the, the striking thing is that, of course, the, the empty samples, if you increase the power uh, gradually until 16 megawatt per square meter, which is very significant, 
of course, the temperature of the samples increases. Um, while for the lithium, this doesn't seem to be the case. The temperature is fixed. There is no change in temperature for some reason. And the reason is vapor shielding. So as I uh, explained before, liquid metal evaporates. Uh, the liquid metal particles, they heat up, they ionize, they start radiating, they are transported elsewhere. In any case, heat is dissipated and not going to the target anymore. And in fact, we can say from this figure alone that um, probably up to two thirds of the power is dissipated by vapor shielding for sure. Um, and if you wonder how you can estimate that, uh, think like this. So we know there is vapor shielding and on the other hand, thermal conduction. Now, thermal conduction is determined by the temperature difference between the surface and coolant. And we know that the cooling water is at 20 degrees Celsius, at least in magnum PSI or whatever it is in another setup. And the surface temperature is locked. We find experimentally that it's always locked at 850 degrees. So that means that if this temperature difference is fixed, also the amount of power going to the coolant is fixed. And this is actually great um, because you can easily destroy uh, your sample if you put too much power to the coolant. Uh, so you can imagine maybe uh, water will heat up, especially where the plasma hits. Uh, and if it starts to boil, if you put too much heat, um, at some point you have boiling at, uh, to such an extent that, that you have zero cooling anymore and your component will just fail. So this is actually a great way to try and avoid that mode of failure. And all the rest of the power uh, has to be vapor shielded. Yeah, that is um, how you can determine roughly how much power you vapor shield. And then maybe a final note on, on the question, why? Why do we have this locking at 850 degrees Celsius? And the answer here lies in into the mechanics of uh, evaporation, more or less. So evaporation is a temperature different process and it uh, goes as a very strong function of temperature. So even the slightest a few degrees of uh, temperature increase uh, will give you a very large increase in uh, evaporative, uh, evaporated particles. And because of that, uh, you only need a very small temperature increase to dissipate, to have a lot more vapor shielding, right? Yeah. So you always end up around this 50, uh, 850 degrees C, but in theory, if you put a lot more power, it should be able to exceed this temperature, right? Because you will need slightly higher, higher uh, temperature to evaporate more particles to handle higher heat loads. So um, let's take a look at some pulses. We know this works in steady state, but what happens during a pulse? And uh, as I said, Magnum can uh, do this quite well. And what we have done here is uh, the most severe loading that we ever did on a sample like this, which is instabilities of one millisecond each uh, applied at 100 hertz. And uh, if you see here, I, I noted in green that each of these uh, little um, peaks is actually about 15 pulses that are so close together that you cannot discern them in this figure. What you can see, the, the lithium target in red is that the base temperature stays uh, more or less constant. Um, the temperature peaks are very high, but actually we think that is because the infrared camera is picking up emission from the vapor cloud rather than the surface. So um, we expect this temperature rise on the surface to be much less. Um, and there is no damage, which we also could observe afterwards. So these samples survive perfectly. Whereas the dummy target without uh, lithium, you can see there the base temperature keeps increasing, increasing until about halfway and then suddenly it seems to dip. Um, and what you see there is actually melting. So there is a big melt pool of molten tungsten the emissivity of that is uh, lower, the infrared emissivity, and that is why the temperature seems to drop. And afterwards, you can see actually that we did uh, make a beautiful uh, uh, drop of tungsten there on our target, which was, uh, of course, unfortunately for the target, but it was a very interesting result. So, what we, can we conclude from this? Well, I would say first, also, vapor shielding still provides sufficient protection in this case. And, and keep in mind, the loading here is really quite severe. If you would uh, calculate this as an average heat flux, I would, I mean, this, this is um, with a wide margin of error, I should say, but it should be somewhere between 25 or 50 megawatt per square meter. 
it is on this ballpark. And and keep in mind, in in a fusion reactor, the steady state heat load that we aim for is about 10 megawatt per square meter. So this is well above that. Uh, yet the target survives. But again, we should note evaporation may be significantly increased in these cases, right? Because to deal with these extremely high loads, we will get increased temperature, uh, despite the temperature locking effect, to evaporate enough lithium. And in fact, uh, now I'll show you some of these uh, camera images. We can have fantastic measurements, uh, really beautiful images, I think, of, of what happens during pulse. So, so you can see uh, uh, from, from left to right and from top to bottom, uh, what's happening in chronological order. You see in steady state, we have, um, uh, you see the target outline in, in red, and there is this uh, white lithium cloud, that's because it's just a black and white image, that uh, is right in front of the target. And then during a pulse, suddenly we get this bright layer of, of light wrapped around the target, and, and you can see after the pulse that this layer expands uh, rapidly, it, it expands really fast. Um, so it appeared that there was, in fact, some sort of compressed high-density vapor layer, um, which which I thought was very interesting because, in fact, you know, you cannot evaporate an infinite amount of liquid metal because it will interfere with your fuel mixture. So there are significant limitations to what you can evaporate, and we should be careful. Even though we can withstand pulses, which is great, um, we should still be careful to, to what we should uh, load this uh, component to. Yeah, um, there are many more interesting things to say about this. Uh, for example, at 100 hertz, at some point we started to uh, observe shock waves, so there appeared to be a buildup of lithium density in the chamber, and you see all kinds of fascinating things. But I will uh, uh, not go into the full depth uh, in this talk, where there is also a bit of a general audience. But if you're interested, please uh, ask me afterwards. So. Now that we have a bit better understanding of what we can do with vapor shielding, let's do the final step. Let's design an improved diverter and see uh, see if this can live up to our expectations. And I'll just drop in right with the design. Here's what it looks like. It's uh, again a water cool design. That's a very proven technology, so we're going to use it. There is a square pipe with a that is round on the inside through which the water is flowing. We have picked 180 degrees Celsius to keep uh, our uh, metal uh, liquid on top, 150 bars to avoid boiling. Um, and then on top, you see on the top, there is this 3D printed texture. That is where the liquid metal is going to be loaded in. And uh, we can play a bit with the thickness of that layer. So how does it look in a full component? Actually, we have to build a vertical wall so it has to stand straight up. It has to be about a meter high, actually uh, 70 centimeters. So that's why it has this orientation. This is the 3D printed texture. It sits on top of these uh, cooling pipes that are curved towards the back, as you can see. And the whole thing is actually placed inside a bath. So the idea is to get a good cover over the whole service uh, to get this uh, reliable. We inject liquid tin from the top, and gravity is just slowly going to drive that to the bottom. Very, very, very slowly. Actually, because there is a little bit of viscous drag, but also there is magnetic drag, which is very significant because of the high magnetic field. And then there is a coolant going through the pipes. That is uh, roughly the layout. All right, so we've uh, set these parameters, and now we can assess, did we do our job? That is the question. So let's assess the performance for uh, two thicknesses. I will start with a uh, two millimeters and then increase to a three millimeter thick printed layer. So in the steady state, remember in steady state, actually there's no vapor shielding allowed because if we have too much evaporation, we contaminate the plasma. We are required to dissipate about 10 megawatt per square meter. And it seems in this case, we can do it. Uh, so, so while keeping below our evaporation limit, which is in fact a surface temperature limit, we can dissipate about 26 megawatt per square meter. If you put a safety margin on that, there is still 18 left, so this is very good. Um, in off normal operation, so let's say we uh, lose the control of the plasma for a little bit, we could expect the heat load to go up significantly to about 18 megawatt per square meter, and this is too much still. I would predict we can um, dissipate around 40 megawatt per square meter. That is much better than the current uh, state of the art, but still it's not enough. 
And then finally, there are the disruptions. Um, disruptions, just to put into perspective, are still about a uh, hundred times more severe than the pulses that we tested in Magnum. So this is a really, really difficult thing to assess. Based on our modeling and the experimental results so far, we think it should be plausible. And that is already a huge improvement. But uh, just to be sure, we have filled these uh, 3D printed samples of ours with tin, and we, will, uh, we have sent them to Ukraine. So uh, in the coming months, they will be tested, and this will be a very exciting result, actually. So what happens if we go to three millimeter? Um, the surface is thicker, it will heat up more easily. That's why in steady state we can reduce, uh, we have to reduce the maximum load to about 18 megawatt per square meter. Um, in off normal operation now, actually, the nice thing is because the surface is uh, a bit hotter and further removed from the pipe, uh, from, the, from the cooling water, actually now vapor shielding allows us to deal with this 80 megawatt per square meter. Um, so this is fantastic. I should say also there is some uncertainty here, so that's why I've just put more than 80 megawatt per square meter instead of an actual number, because you need uh, very good estimates of the actual energy dissipated per evaporated particle, this kind of uh, thing. And for disruptions, actually, there's no difference because for disruptions, only the top uh, tenths of a millimeter of the CPS uh, play a role because the pulse is so incredibly short that the heat doesn't really penetrate much further. All right. So in any case, I would say uh, this is could, let's say, could definitely be an improvement. Uh, that's what this concept could be. And of course, to prove that, we should make a mock-up. We should test this thing. That's what I'm doing uh, right now. So um, here you can see the mock-up under construction. There is a water inlet, a water outlet, a liquid metal outlet. There will be a liquid metal, uh, separate liquid metal inlet. That's why it's not in the picture. And then in the middle, you can see three uh, 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 pipes. They are square on the outside. And that is where the CPS will be printed on top of. Uh, so that's roughly how it's going to look like. And the reason that we put it in steel is just that we have to demonstrate you know, the concept first, also with the flowing liquid metal. And, and the next step will be to make it out of the, the really high performance heat sink materials, the, the fancy copper alloys. And then finally, I wanted to uh, end with this uh, fantastic picture of the of the CPS of the of the three D printed tungsten, which is being made uh, with uh, Philips and with uh, Dunlay. They they did this uh, test print on a steel slab, and uh, the real texture is being printed uh, as we speak uh, on the on the actual mock up. Yeah. All right. That brings us to the conclusion. So, what have we seen? We have seen that. Um, we can enable experiments. This is very important because now we can start to learn. We have learned about vapor shielding and we have much better insights into how it works, at what temperatures temperature locking occurs, and this information we have used to develop a concept and estimate if that could be an improvement. So my answer to the question, if this is a good idea, would be yes. This is Definitely a good idea. This definitely brings us closer to a viable fusion reactor. And that is my answer. So thanks for your attention. Great. Thanks a lot, Peter. Very interesting uh, talk, very clear. I'm uh, happy to see that there's also a bunch of questions already. Um, so um, I'm going to start with by start with 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 Hans van Eck just from the list the list that I have right here. So I'm sorry if I didn't make it in the right order, but I think Hans is first. So Hans, go ahead. I think MJ was first, but I'll I'll go ahead. Uh, thanks, Peter, for this uh, nice talk. I was wondering a little bit about the mock-up. So. Yes. Um, and then the flow speed of the liquid metal. So right. can you tell a little bit more how did you determine which flow speed you need and is it engineered for this flow speed or you do not know? <laughs> no, so um, actually 
Yes, so I can tell you about this. So uh, there are actually two things that you need to take care about uh, when when you are designing the CPS. And, and flow speed is actually not number one. What you want to take care of first is flow stability. So um, you have to design the geometry such that the liquid can flow through smoothly without uh, bulging out at any point. So uh, we tested this actually with uh, just a water flow experiment. Uh, so we printed a bunch of uh, plastic uh, geometries actually with a student, Joop, he did a fantastic work on this. And um, that is why we selected the geometry that we have. And actually the geometry is just a, a really uh, rectangular array, let's say, of these little tree type structures. So I'll, I'll show you again. Uh, and, and so the channels in between these uh, that go through this array are pointed ver perfectly vertical. And there you have very smooth flow and the space in between that appears to just get filled up with uh, capillary forces. And that's the most important thing. And then for the flow speed, of course, the flow speed should be sufficient, more than sufficient, to uh, compensate for the evaporation that you expect. But it turns out that uh, the evaporation rate, which of course should be very low, is indeed very low. And so, and, and especially the fact that we are flowing a liquid and not a, not a gas or a plasma, makes it you need a really low flow speed. So we are talking about uh, something like uh, 10 to the, like let's say 0 0.1 millimeter per second, this order of magnitude flow speed. It's really, really low. Yeah. And of course, if you increase the field, um, this goes down even faster, yeah, because it goes uh, quadratically, the magnetic drag goes quadratically with the field, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I, I think if I understand the, the way the, 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 the hands work in teams, uh, I should come to Jos uh, Scholten next, and then I'll, I'll come to MJ. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for your presentation. Uh, I had a question because uh, now you've only made a mock-up. Uh, do you know how you can go towards a larger scale for the full fusion device? Because if you would want to print it uh, as one part, you would need a very large uh, 3D printer. And if you're going to make it from smaller parts, do you know how you can connect it? And if you have problems where the two parts connect so that you have uh, not a sufficient lithium flow in this part? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, I think. Um, so the reason we're doing a mock-up now is just because you want to start small, right? You want to... Uh, mm -hmm. Do a small test before you invest a lot of money into a big test. Um, that being said, though, I, I I think the challenges that you mentioned are the right ones. I think it would be a bad idea to connect different pieces together because um, you know for, for maybe for the three D printed structure that's fine, but these cooling pipes are really under a lot of stress and and they really have to be leak tight. So you don't want to do that. Um, so it would be good if we if we make that in one piece, develop bigger printers, which I think I, I don't see any technological obstacle to do that, except for uh, cost, which is in fact not a technological obstacle. Um, and then we should print on that. The there is one challenge with printing, though, also a very te a technical practical challenge, is that currently these printers work with a with a powder bed. So there is a, a flat bed of powder, and you. Uh, you know, you pull the laser across that and then you uh, swipe over a fresh layer of powder. But this bed has to be perfectly flat. But the diverter pipes may not be perfectly flat. And in fact, um, uh, right, wow. because they are in assembly, the, maybe the tolerances are just not good enough. So it would be great if we can uh, think of a way to fix that. And, and actually the reason that here in the mock-up these three pipes are built from one block is to create that required flatness. That is the one reason that we do this. Um, but this will be an interesting challenge for the future, yeah. Uh, but I'm sure we can do that. There are plenty of uh, uh, printing schemes also with powder jets in better, instead of beds. And uh, well, you can get creative, yeah. But that's definitely okay. the next stage. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question, if I'm allowed. Uh, uh, if you can make it a short one, yours, because there's a lot of other people ask, who, who want to ask questions. Okay, I will make it short. So the, you have a high heat pulse um, on your diverter, but only uh, a constant amount of heat uh, flux is going towards your cooling. So you also have a large 
um, heat flux which goes towards your first wall. Uh, do you think that gives a problem on the first wall, this uh, additional um, heat flux due to your air instabilities? Yeah, that's a good question. I think not actually because so the problem with cooling is usually not uh, the total amount of heat but it's the heat flux density the amount of uh, watts per square meter and and by radiating or somehow transporting to the first wall which has a you know a thousand times bigger surface area you spread that out and and i think that that is definitely one way to go with this yeah although i'm not an expert on the first wall and the constraints playing uh, a role there so I should note that, but I do think it's a good approach. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jos. Um, I will come now to MJ. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a really well presented seminar. Um, thanks. Uh, I will. I will say I had to miss uh, two or three minutes in the middle of it. So if um, what I'm going to ask has already been answered in the talk, I do apologize. Um, right. So. In, uh, in a standard uh, diverter or a standard wall per se, you have a constant neutron flux. The neutron uh, flux damages the tungsten, which creates voids, vacancy clusters, um, and so forth. Now, when you slab liquid metal on top of that, um, conceivably, those voids or vacancy clusters could fill up with the liquid metal, which could do potentially one of two things, which could influence the flow mechanics, or it could um, impact surface chemistry. Um, I do not know offhand with what I would expect really whether that would be an issue, but I do wonder whether there is any plan um, to repeat those uh, experiments you did uh, with the uh, uh, damaged tungsten samples or the damaged tungst tungsten uh, floor, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I see. I see what you mean. So a neutron irradiated. Uh, well, n neutron irradiated will be difficult, but or, you could, for instance, do tungsten self damaged. Yes, yeah, yeah, Sample. something yeah. assimilation of that. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, yeah, so in, in, in my mind, this indeed is a very open topic. So so we have only a hypothesis. Um, I would say there can be some, yeah, so, some pros and some cons, let's say, right? So, so the issue that you mentioned that there could be pores in which the liquid metal could go. Um, and influence maybe the the uh, f uh, let's say the flow dynamics for the worse. That could be bad, but it could also be great because now you don't have any open voids that that reduce your thermal conductivity. And uh, the same thing you could say about uh, helium production, for example, right? Uh, there might be helium production, which leads to swelling and whatnot. But if this uh, 3D printed tungsten is already a, some some kind of micro porosity to begin with, so so I'm talking about really the the printed bulk, not the intentional porosity that we print in it, but really the porosity in the bulk there, which is also there. Um, you might use that actually to your advantage. Maybe uh, this is fine enough for helium bubbles to escape. Um, I'm not sure actually, but but that is a thought I, I would have. Um, it it so would yeah, also though potentially pose a problem that if um, tritium were bred in a lithium uh, liquid, then that would then more easily go into the tungsten and then you would have retention. Yeah, that, that might be an issue. Um, that's a good one. I hadn't thought of that. I, I should say I, I can I can add to, to that that uh, the demo, the European demo team, which is, you know, uh, trying to design a more conservative design that, that will definitely work. Um, is very against use of lithium because of very good reasons that not only do you have a tiny bit of breeding because of course it's still a very thin layer um, with almost no neutron uh, absorption or stopping power uh, you will have a lot of tritium absorption simply from the plasma because lithium and uh, hydrogen isotopes really like each other so <laughs> you can uh, absorb the entire uh, fuel uh, your, your tritium reserve in no time and and we know how much effort it takes to breed that so that's not something you want to do yeah yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And uh, you might want to talk to Beata about some of the details because she's an expert on these damage. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, maybe it's a good idea to set up a project on this. Maybe. Maybe the time has uh, come to uh, dive into this issue. That's a uh, yeah. Thanks for the suggestion. Sure. Thanks. Right. Um, then I will come to Mariam Schweper, please. <laughs> yeah. I was just 
a little bit curious about how these testing, disruption testing in Ukraine will actually happen. Right, yeah. Okay, so they have, uh, you can look this up, they have a device, uh, or multiple devices, I believe, which are various types of plasma accelerators. One, one is called the QSPA, so QSPA. And there are some papers on this, so basically they generate the plasma and they somehow accelerate <clears throat> it um, to create huge uh, short uh, heat loads. Um, so the pulse lengths vary, I believe, from somewhere to a millisecond to fractions of a millisecond to even a microsecond, I recall. Um, so they they are, let's say, much more representative of what a disruption would be. Um, they have already done, there are papers that you can find for how that works with lithium uh, in, in some kind of porous uh, substrate, not the 3D printed one, unfortunately. And the lithium one seems to perform fairly well. Uh, so so there, as far as I know, there is no damage as long as you make that substrate out of tungsten and not of anything else. <laughs> Um, yeah, and now the question is, will that work with the 3D printed samples and will it work with liquid tin? And um, um, yeah, maybe, maybe uh, I, I don't think everybody knows this, but tin and lithium uh, melt at roughly the same temperature, right? At 180 degrees for lithium and 230 for tin. But tin does tend to evaporate uh, much less easily. So that is why you can have some higher surface temperatures with tin also in a reactor. Um, but that is at the same time the reason why it might be not as resilient to disruptions as lithium because you need a much higher temperature to evaporate sufficient tin and maybe that temperature is in excess of the tungsten melting point mm -hmm. i don't know but it's possible yeah so we will see uh, i don't know if that answers your question yeah yeah it does thank you okay yeah great thanks um then uh F Uh, you 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 meant me, Thomas. I, yes. I didn't fully uh, get the. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question, uh, Peter, uh, which is related to uh, very fast transient events like uh, disruptions, where the replenishing of the uh, layer will never be fast enough. I would yes. think that given the thickness of the layer you should then be able to calculate the uh, maximum energy <coughs> that you can uh, spend before you've evaporated uh, your complete uh, layer yes what, what, what kind of numbers do you then get yeah excellent question okay I, I would have to look it up but so we did this indeed and it's in uh it's in a paper i published uh, you can look it up if you want it's uh from 2017 or so and we did exactly this, um, but for the numbers, uh, and, and also I should say we looked it up for, uh, sorry, we calculated for lithium, um, which is not tin, and the calculation is very dependent on, on how exactly you assume the evaporation rate to be dependent on temperature. So, right, there, there are, of course, equations, a uh, language equation that describes evaporation, but then there's also redeposition and all kinds of processes in the plasma. So what is then, you know, the effective evaporation rate? You need to know this. And then how much this energy does one particle uh, dissipate in the plasma? Does one particle of lithium dissipate, uh, I don't know, 500 or 5 electron volts, right? So, and th that already shows you there are some order of magnitude errors here. But nevertheless, if you would have a uh, lithium surface thickness of, let's say, uh, 0.1 millimeter, so 10 to the four, minus 4 meters, uh, 0.1 millimeter, I would say if the lithium radiates very effectively in these conditions, so let's say it dissipates about 500 electron volts per uh, lithium particle, you can withstand a disruption of, let's say, uh, this is 1, 2, 3, 400 megajoules per square meter. So that is about uh, 200, uh, no, let's say, yeah, 400, 800 gigawatt for a millisecond, right? So you can withstand astronomous amount of power if you uh, withstand, if, if you uh, evaporate uh, enough. And if, indeed, it's limited by the surface thickness. Yeah. If I understand your question correctly, this depends mostly on 
the uh, radiative losses per evaporated uh, atom rather than on the energy required for evaporation. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the energy required for evaporation is about uh, an order of one electron volt, right? Whereas you can you can calculate from collisional radiative modeling the the cooling that happens in the plasma just because the particle heats up and gets ionized and then radiates. And then at some point radiation becomes a really big contribution above a certain electron temperature and actually the main contribution. And so you can get definitely up to these orders of a few hundred EV for, for lithium and higher for a tin. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. I think I can also add on as, as a comment, Peter, that it depends a lot on what the redeposition rate is during this disruption. Because you can have a, let's say, non-coronal behavior where you have a lot more radiation per particle because the, the lithium is ionized, radiates a little bit, but then returns to the surface and this process repeats many times per second. Yeah. And this can yeah. be a, a force multiplier, let's say, for how much power is radiated by the lithium. Yeah, definitely. And and uh, this is the, definitely an important point. So so it influences, right, the amount of lithium available, more or less, and, and how much temperature it takes to get it off the surface. Um, but also, one more thing even is that during a disruption, you, you, there are, of course, electric currents also uh, going through the wall, right? There is quite a probability of that. And they are going to exert huge forces on the liquid metal. And um, maybe they are pushing it out of the CPS or let's say towards the plasma facing surface, towards the plasma. And um, yeah, you can see that as a bad thing, right? Maybe it will then fly through the reactor chamber to somewhere you don't want, but also maybe it will locally increase the amount of uh, available lithium and actually th there is a student uh, working on this right now as an intern uh, so so yeah this is a very interesting topic okay, good experiments cool. will, will show yeah uh then i think we have a couple more questions so i would like to get to them so first we have yella the fish uh yes uh, thank you peter um so i have more of a practical question so you mentioned that um your design for your wall will be about a, a meter tall um, and i think that the current walls are quite a lot smaller from my understanding and that there is not that much space available in the most uh, devices so do you think that this could be a problem uh, yeah good okay yeah good question and uh, but actually to answer it uh, is uh, to understand more or less the design process so so the way the demo, the European demo design works is there is a central design team. They make sort of, let's call it a system architecture. And of course, also on a concept level, but nevertheless, it's an architecture. And they divide the space. So they say, Peter, you uh, have to build the thing of 70 centimeters high. And I say, okay, and that's it. <laughs> and they have, of course, their reasons uh, for choosing this height. So they, for example, say, look, the strike point is going to be this wide the control systems are going to be this accurate, so we need this margin around it, and then uh, we add some safety margin, and they see then uh, if that fits, uh, like you said, if that fits with all the other systems. But of course, you know, demo is quite big. The the, the major radius is, what, eight, nine meters? Um, so, so this is big, but maybe not too big. Yeah. Okay, is, thanks. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, it's good, thanks. Yeah, it's a oh. it's a demand. Yeah. Uh, then I think um, we come to the last question, um, which is from Suleiman. Hi, Peter. Thank you for the presentation. I am looking for an answer. Why does lithium work? So you you give some clues about uh, about this in your presentation and in the answer section. Um, so one of them was because it can suck hydrogen. Uh, so that means that you have to form lithium hydride, but we know that lithium hydride is not a very stable compound. I mean, there are other metals that can suck hydrogen more efficiently. Um, did you also um, quantify experimentally the, the physical reason why lithium works? So, for instance, can you quantify formation of lithium hydride or can you quantify other uh, properties related to lithium, let's say, uh, because lithium has a low cohesive energy, that means that it can separate into atomic uh, form, so it can uh, create new ions. Uh, so it, it can uh, eject ions into your bacterial plasma. 
So for instance, can you look into this kind of uh, issues? And the last issue is maybe is the, the secondary electron emission. <laughs> so when you have the bombardment from plasma, so you have uh, high energy electrons that goes to metal, and then the metal electrons have been excited uh, can, can be released back to the plasma. So can you quantify this kind of effects in your experiments? Um. Okay, let, let, let me see if I uh, get your question straight. When, when you say when the liquid metal works, when the lithium works, what do you mean exactly works for what? For the, for the effective vapor shielding? I mean, you present it like it, it's a um, good solution for the diver. Yes. Okay, okay, so, yeah. Okay, so good. Uh, no, I think what's I understand. The physical uh, reasoning why it works. Yeah, okay. Um, I think... I think I should maybe nuance then my, my answer a bit. So so I think uh, lithium works great when it comes to power handling and, and probably some other things. But um, let me state the most important is that this tritium retention issue, because I, I mean, we have done experiments and also actually uh, other PhDs in the group of Thomas have done extensive experiments with uh, on the retention of tritium or deuterium, right? Um, and I really think for, for the European demo, you should be extremely careful. So it would be f much preferred to use liquid tin. Okay, then as to your question, why, why does it seem to work? Um, unfortunately, my experiments do not give uh, much insight into this, I, sh I, sh I should say. So my experiments mainly show that it does work and, and it shows to what extent it, it works, how much power you should be able uh, or should expect to handle. But, but to really say what is the mechanism, right? Uh, what is the dominant, uh, let's say, um, is there more recombination or is there more um, uh, ionization and what is the resulting balance between ions and neutrals and in what charge state are they and, and on what from what transition do we get the most radiation? My experiments, um, have, have, I, I, I don't have results that, that show you this directly. Um, you would need to do really focus on the plasma physics, whereas I focus more on the on the power handling. Um, that being said, you can do that. Um, you can of course do that. There there are plenty of uh, good spectroscopic diagnostics on Magnum. So if you wanted, you could set up a study and, and dive into this in detail. And what I should also say is, uh, I believe modeling will give you a very good uh, insight into this. So so. There are, there have been students and there are PhDs that differ, for example, uh, Ray Chandra, if you want to talk to uh, him, for example, he uh, is working right now on uh, sort of Sol PS type modeling, so uh, uh, Monte Carlo coupled with a plasma fluid code to, to look into this into much greater detail for lithium. Uh, thin is, of course, more complex, but you can do it. And of course, you could uh, benchmark. Uh, you can use my experiments to benchmark these uh, codes, right? So you can say, look, the code uh, says that we should um, expect this much power to be dissipated by a vapor shielding, and you can compare it to the experiment. And in fact, we also have experiments uh, pretty recently to to uh, uh, that show you where evaporated lithium goes through, so we know something about transport. Um, I know in the past, uh, you should ask Thomas, th there was a lot of uh, work on secondary electron emission. Um, OK, but I have to uh, disappoint you a bit. I cannot uh, give you a, a detailed answer on this, I'm afraid. Yeah. OK, thanks. OK, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I think uh, you were able to answer. You answered everybody now, Peter. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank you again uh, for a very nice talk. Uh, so thank you again. Yes, thank you all for attending. Uh, and uh, thanks everybody for attending. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, don't forget to vote. Don't forget to vote for Peter for the uh, for the new scientist award.